Hi, everyone. I'm Walt Learmore. I want to share with you a presentation that I gave at the William A. Brookshire LSU Military Museum in October of 2023. It was entitled At First Light, How a Teenager Became a World War II Hero, and it's based upon an award-winning book that I wrote with Mike Yorkie entitled At First Light. Well, my brothers and I who grew up here in Baton Rouge were like almost every boy who grew up in the 1950s and early 1960s. We loved watching World War II epics on TV and at the movie theaters. Personally, we wanted to believe that our dads who had fought during the war had been brave and courageous soldiers. In fact, I wondered if my dad had been a hero like Audie Murphy, who was said to be the most decorated soldier in World War II, and later wrote a best-selling book and starred in a highly successful movie about his bravery and exploits. If so, then my brothers and I could brag to our friends about that, but since Dad never talked about his experiences as a soldier when we were kids, we couldn't match the tales that other boys told when they boasted about their father's wartime exploits. But Dad sure appeared to be a hero to me because not only had he lost a leg during the war, but in his small home office, the walls were covered with pictures signed by generals. There was one with Dad leading an honor guard for General Dwight D. Eisenhower later to serve as the 34th president of the United States. And on the left there, you can see British Field Marshal Monty Montgomery. Major General John W. O'Daniel, one of dad's commanders in the war, had written on the back of a picture to my father, to a fighting man, a phrase I later learned he had repeated each time he presented my father with a medal of valor on the battlefield. Brigadier General Robert Nicholas Young, another 3rd Infantry Division commander, wrote, with great admiration of Phil as one of the outstanding combat soldiers in World War II. And Dad's shadow box displayed only some of his medals, but they included all of the U.S. Army's Medals of Valor except the Medal of Honor. But his most pride award was the Combat Infantryman Badge, which was only awarded to infantrymen who fought in active frontline combat during war. But he never talked about his wartime exploits until his and mom's 45th wedding anniversary in 1994. My brothers and I were visiting with dad, and that night one of my brothers said, so pop, how did you really lose your leg? And to our surprise, he decided that it was the right moment to share parts of his remarkable battles in Europe alongside two million other young American men. However, he strongly denied being a hero. He said, sure, we who were wounded suffered, but there were over 100,000 who never came home. Son, he said, those were the heroes. And starting that night over, and over the next few years, he shared more and more stories. But to be honest, my brothers and I found most of them to be simply unbelievable. Then after he suddenly passed away in 2003, I discovered in his attic a footlocker full of over 400 letters home, a half dozen scrapbooks of articles and documents, and even two history books, both of which documented several of his amazing tales. So let me share a Cliff Notes version of his history and heroics. His story began in Memphis, Tennessee, where he was the only child of parents who worked full time. Dad was, well, to put it mildly, rather unruly as a boy. But he was a gifted Boy Scout, hunter, marksman, equestrian, outdoorsman, and a swimmer. In fact, on a dare as a nine-year-old, he and a friend swam across the raging Mississippi River twice during flood stage. He was a natural and gifted horseman, and one of his favorite childhood memories was seeing the stunning white dancing Lipizzan horses from Vienna, Austria the world-famous Lipizzaners, and on his 12th birthday, he vowed to see them in Europe one day, and boy, did he ever. But because of poor grades in school and rowdy behavior, his parents sent him off to military school when he was only 13 years old. He spent four years in high school at the Gulf Coast Military Academy in Gulfport, Mississippi. This is his freshman picture. He would often joke that his best two years in high school were his freshman year. But at GCMA, he did well. His innate gifts and talents, as well as his leadership skills, just blossomed. And he graduated with honors, with honors in 1942, only five months after the attack on, World, on Pearl Harbor. And as a 17-year-old, he was admitted to and then became the youngest ever graduate of the Army's Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia, where typically only college graduates were admitted. 
He was commissioned as a second lieutenant and awarded the Boy Scouts Eagle Scout Award just days after his 18th birthday. After completing over 10 months of infantry special training, including obtaining glider pilot wings, a parachutist badge or jump wings, and certification as a demolition expert and an expert marksman badge, he sailed on a Liberty ship for nine days through the U-boat infested North Atlantic to French Morocco and then boarded a train to Tunisia before shipping out to Anzio, Italy. On the Anzio beachhead, which was a split of land only 10 miles deep and 15 miles wide, he commanded a frontline ammunition and pioneer or A&P platoon in the 30th Infantry Regiment of the 3rd Infantry Division. He and his men worked all night, every night, to deliver ammo to the front line. From dusk until first light, they laid barbed wire and razor wire, as well as set and, dif and diffused mines in no man's land, often just yards in front of the enemy foxholes. In fact, one night, a, a German soldier just yards away from, from dad and a man sneezed, and dad's man said, Gesundheit, to which the German soldier said, Denke. Well, the Allies were completely encircled by the Germans who were in the adjoining mountains, and the GIs became sitting ducks during a four-month, 24-hour-a-day bombardment. The men, the men had to dig even deeper into the muddy, icy ground. And when the spring uh, thaw finally came, so did hordes of mosquitoes from the Anzio swamps. Early on, Dad was hospitalized for a severe case of malaria. He was offered his first Purple Heart in the hospital, but turned it down and left against medical advice to get back to his men. The entire stalemate on Anzio, which, which Nazi propaganda labeled as death's head, was literally a replay of the horrendous trench warfare of World War I in Europe. Most of the men that had joined the armed services did so for patriotism and venture, to defeat fascism and tyranny, to protect liberty and freedom, and, and to knock, as they said, to knock the Heil out of Hitler. But very soon into battle, idealism was shattered by reality. On Dad's first night in no man's land on Anzio, one of his men made a mistake with a landmine and blew his own face off. The next night, Dad was walking with one of his men who was literally cut in half by a German 88 anti-aircraft projectile that was shot horizontally. The third night, one of, one of his men made the mistake of thinking the surrender of two Germans was sincere. And when he stood, they ducked, and Dad's man was killed instantly by a sniper who blew his head off. This led Dad to, to pioneer the use of mules to carry both supplies to the front at night and to protect his men. It didn't take long on the front lines for these inexperienced young patriots to experience the terror of war and to be transformed into men literally fighting for their lives and the buddies they came to love. One dawn at first light, Dad's platoon was assigned to lay mines in direct view of the Germans who were only 50 to 100 yards away. It was a suicide mission. So rather than sending one of his men, Dad went out himself. As the ground around him was shredded by mortar, machine gun, tyke, tank, and sni sniper fire, he successfully accomplished his mission. And for his heroism, even as an 18-year-old teenager, he was awarded his first Silver Star. Then he received his first of three presidential unit citations with the 3rd Infantry Division, breaking out of the beachhead and fighting hellacious battles too, and then liberating Rome. The men of the 3rd Infantry Division saw themselves not as conquerors, but as liberators, and they were warmly greeted as such by the Italians. But unfortunately, the liberation of Rome occurred on June 4th and 5th, 1944. So the front lines already being printed across the U.S. were thrown into the trash due to another event the next day on June 6, 1944, and that was the Normandy invasion. The liberation of Rome was never really celebrated at home, which was terribly disappointed to Dad and the entire 3rd Infantry Division. Nevertheless, the soldiers enjoyed a few days of Roman holiday before beginning intensive training for what would be the 3rd Infantry Division's 5th Amphibious Assault, or D-Day, of the war. Don't miss this forgotten fact. The Northern Front guys had one D-Day, Normandy, while the 3rd Infantry Division and the other Southern Front units 
slugged through five D-Days in French Morocco, Sicily, Salerno, and Anzio, Italy. And then their fifth and final D-Day was a massive amphibious assault on the beaches of southern France on August 15th, 1944, during which Dad had an interesting interaction with, with Winston Churchill, which is in the book. In fact, Dad sent his, uh, his shoulder flag patch home to his mom, uh, and that's uh, this shoulder patch is included in his exhibit here at the LSU Military Museum. The invasion was stunningly successful, and the liberation of countless rich towns and villages began in earnest. Once again, the men were greeted as heroes and liberators, and they reveled in every moment, especially the bottles of wine, the flowers, and the copious kisses from young French women wearing their finest dresses and attire. Dan and the 3rd Infantry Division quickly raced up hundreds of miles up the Rhone Valley, chasing the rapidly retreating German 19th Army. An arm wound resulted in his first Purple Heart and first Bronze Star, but Dad refused hospitalization. He and his love company, or Company L, of the 30th Infantry Regiment also earned a second presidential unit citation. But as the winter of 1944-1945 approached, the GIs of the 3rd Infantry Division were the spearhead of the first army in history to defeat a dug-in enemy in the rugged Vosges Mountains of northeastern France. During gruesome combat, he once again pioneered the use of mules to carry supplies. But one hellacious night, he was severely wounded and awarded a second Purple Heart. He recovered in a field hospital in a bed next to Audie Murphy. They became fast friends. During their hospitalization, Audie Murphy proposed to a head nurse on their officer's ward, and she finally, <laughs> politely, turned him down. After recovering, Dad was sent back to his unit on Christmas Eve, 1944, to the frozen Colmar pocket in Alsace, France. Dad told me most know about the Battle of the Bulge, but almost no one remembers the arguably and even more potentially disastrous Battle of the Colmar Pocket, waged in some of the worst winter wartime conditions ever recorded. In fact, it was the worst winter in Europe in almost five decades. Stephen Ambrose, the author of Band of Brothers, wrote, it was fought in conditions so terrible that they can only be marveled at, not really imagined. Only those who were there can know. More than once, Ambrose wrote, in interviewing veterans of the January fighting, when I asked them to describe the cold, men involuntarily shivered. After their stunning victory at Colmar, as part of the 3rd Infantry Division, Dad was awarded a third presidential unit citation, a second Bronze Star, and promoted to be one of the youngest company commanders in the Army at just 20 years of age. The commanding general of the first French army presented the order of the Quartergar with palm and the French forge to dad and the men of the third infantry division. And then the division trained for the invasion into Germany. It was horribly difficult, but they battled to and then broke through the dreaded and daunted Siegfried line. That extraordinarily fortified 400 mile long west wall of Germany and raced across southern Germany, where Dad was awarded his third Purple Heart, a second Silver Star, and the Distinguished Service Cross. In his 15 months of brutal battles, Dad had been a second lieutenant at 18 years of age, a first lieutenant at 19, and a captain and company commander at 20. Dad's bravery was also evident when he told us about being part of an extremely risky, risky top-secret mission. He was flown in a Piper Pub aircraft far behind the enemy lines, almost 200 miles in Czechoslovakia, to investigate a rumor that Hitler had confiscated all the famous Libas honors to breed the perfect horse for his hoped for perfect Aryan race. If Dad or the pilot had been captured or killed, they would have been declared AWOL and the mission disavowed. The Nazi veterinarians at the massive horse farm were terrified that all the horses would be killed and eaten by the starving Russian army that was invading from the east. Fortunately, Dad's mission was a success and led to Operation Cowboy, approved by General Patton, which saved the world-famous Lipizzaners from extinction. And then three days later, on April 8, 1945, exactly one month before the end of the war in Europe, Dad and his men were in a day of endless firefights that began at first light 
and a heavily wooded for forest in southern Germany. German sni snipers were picking off his men. Machine gun nests slowed the advance of the GI. Well camouflaged artillery fired projectiles into the tree canopy that were timed to burst and rain down white hot, shrap white hot shrapnel, which shredded any of the soldiers below. One eyewitness to Dad's heroism on that fateful day wrote, Captain Laramore had been ordered to proceed with all possible speed, completely disregarding the considerable amount of small arms being delivered. He moved his leading platoon into the assault. Because of his vigorous efforts, the enemy quickly ascertained that he was a commander and redoubled their efforts to destroy him. The attack was continued through the woods and into the afternoon against the tenacious enemy. Captain Laramore moved at the head of his company, strenuously directing the attack. So stubborn was the resistance, it was necessary for him to engage in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And during the melee, Captain Laramore killed a German officer at point-blank range with his pistol. And at that point, for the moment, the resistance ceased. Then Dad learned that one of his squads was surrounded under, under heavy fire from 150 enemy. In the chaos, he organized an attack to save his men. He jumped on the back of a Sherman tank and went to rescue him. The eyewitness wrote, I saw him on the rear of the tank, firing at the woods to our front, operating the 50 caliber machine gun operated on the tank. Despite the bullets, which continuously struck the tank within inches of him, Captain Laramore coolly continued to fire, changing ammunition boxes regularly and inflicting dozens and dozens of casualties on the, on the enemy, including wiping out three machine gun nests, allowing his men to be rescued. Dad later told the story of suddenly feeling warm liquid pulsing down his leg. And although he felt no pain, he knew he'd been shot in the hip and his femoral artery was hemorrhaging. He had only a moment to stop it and not bleed to death. So he quickly unbuckled his belt to make a, tournament, a tourniquet to stop the bleeding. And that's when he saw that, that the bullet had just punctured his canteen and it was water soaking his pants. But just then he was stunned by a sniper's bullet that glanced off of his helmet. He jumped off the, uh, off the back of the tank as another sniper bullet struck his helmet again. He began firing his M1 Garand, killing several snipers and advancing Germans when he felt an excruciating jolt of searing agony in his right shin. He hit the ground and despite unbearable pain, managed to roll into a shallow ditch. The tank pulled back into the woods as the tank commander was sure that dad had been killed. Dad peeked over the edge and saw several dozen German, German soldiers firing as fast as they could while screaming at the top of their lungs, rushing forward. And when they were only 20 to 30 yards away, Dad lowered his head. The enemy soldiers leaped over him and kept running. He put a tourniquet above the gaping wound and then lost consciousness. At, at dusk, Major McFalls found Dad alive but close to death. He wrote this, Laramore was was lying about 10 yards from a dead German killed by himself. His leg wound was the size of a silver dollar. He also had two bullet scars on his helmet and his canteen had been penetrated by another bullet. As dad was being rushed to the field hospital, Major McFalls wrote that, quote, a German officer and the 30 remaining men came out of the woods and surrendered. The officer further stated that his men were demoralized at the appearance of the man on, on the tank that bullets could not stop. The surgeon saved dad's life, but not his leg. After the leg amputation, dad was stabilized and while preparing to board a C-47 equipped as a hospital plane to fly him back to the US, he was met plainside by General Eisenhower. Dad said General Eisenhower greeted each man, ordering, ordered, ordering them to stay seated and at ease in their wheelchairs and on their litters. When he helped, when he knelt by daddy, he smiled and said, what you men have done over here is spectacular. Some never saw the Germans, he said. Most saw too many. But there was not a single instance where your division failed. All dad could think to say was, thank you, sir, as the German moved on to the next man. Dad was airlifted to Lawson General Hospital, Atlanta, for one year of intense rehabilitation. And there he learned two discouraging facts. Although young single girls loved men in uniform, especially those with a lot of medals, they did not cotton to amputees. 
And second, U.S. Army policy stipulated that any Army officer with an amputation would be discharged from the military after rehabilitation. He felt compelled to, to formally appeal this unjust, inhumane, insane, and inane policy, although he knew it would be an uphill battle. But he had some strong allies for his upcoming fight. After his hospital discharge, General Eisenhower facilitated his transfer to Fort Myer in Washington, D.C. to appeal the Army's policy. And while there, Dad rode with a caisson platoon at Arlington National Cemetery, played bridge almost weekly with General Eisenhower, and was befriended by President Truman as his appeals process worked its way through the War Department. Here he is accompanying the president, laying a wreath at the tomb of the unknowns. I actually found the transcript of his final hearing in the National Archives in Washington. It was appalling how some of the colonels on that panel viewed officers who were amputees. One of them exclaimed, you're a handicap to the Army. You're a cripple. Mind you, a highly decorated cripple, but still a cripple. And shockingly, another colonel said, amputee, amputee officers simply don't have a place in my Army. It was clear that dad no longer was considered fully human, at least no longer officer and gentleman material. He lost his appeal by a razor thin margin of one vote. He always wanted a career in the army, but now that was stolen from him, not just by a German sniper, but by this insane policy of the army he loved. It was during this time of growing despondence and depression that dad had a series of heartfelt conversations with an army chaplain. But at least he, he had the strength and wisdom to seek help. And after confessing his feelings to the chaplain, he heard this life-altering advice. Son, your wounds, physical, emotional, and spiritual, will either make you a bitter person or a better person. They'll either harden your heart or soften it. You'll either be a person changed for the worse or one who chases who chooses to make both your life and the world better. Your resilience does not depend upon what others do to you or what the world foists upon you, but your resilience depends completely on how you choose to respond. The chaplain added this, the worst handicap in life isn't being disabled. It's being disabled with a bad attitude. The Germans smashed your leg, but don't let them shatter your heart, your talents, your gifts, your will, or your faith in God and his plan for you. Again, the choice is up to you. Dad said his, his attitude and his outlook changed, and he began to ask God for wisdom and guidance and the support of family and friends to survive and even thrive through the storms and challenges that would lay ahead. That would lay ahead. Dad came to grips with the fact that the Lord had another plan for him, not the army, but he just had to discover what it would be. And at 22 years of age, he was honorably discharged, medically discharged as a major, and the Distinguished Service Cross was pinned on him as the entire military district of Washington, the entire caisson platoon, the honor guard from the Arlington National Cemetery turned out to parade in his army as his beaming fiance stood by him. Dead finished college and graduate school at the University of Virginia Harris. He's pictured with a graduation alongside his proud father. He married the love of his life and he became a renowned award-winning equestrian. By the way, I've, I've not mentioned any of his amazing war horse stories, nor the story of the horse that he's pictured with here, Chugwater, the horse that he says saved his life. Those stories are in the book. Then dad learned that just three years later, the army changed its policy and allowed amputee officers to stay in the service. And he succeeded in a remarkable, over 40-year-long career as an esteemed professor of, of cartography, map making, at Louisiana State University, which he jokingly called Harvard on the Bayou. Dad set specific standards for the cartographic section, resulting in national and international reputation for high-quality maps and mapping. He published research on two new techniques of creating and reproducing map maps, and he was always a proponent of early education and geography. In fact, he was recognized as the father of geographic education in the state of Louisiana and was selected to be a member of the prestigious National Scientific Society, Sigma Xi. 
One of Dad's cartographers, Mary Lee Eckert, produced the maps that are in Dad's book, and he and she donated to the him, uh, donated them to the book in his memory. For decades, Dad was a beloved scoutmaster. In this picture, Mom places the Silver Beaver Award around his neck. It's Boy Scouting's highest honor. He guided, coached, and disciplined countless young men, several of whom named their firstborn sons after him. But most of all, he was a loyal and devoted husband and father to me and my three brothers. Dad died in his sleep on October 31, 2003. He was 78 years of age. He had a reserved plot in a special area of Arlington National Cemetery, but chose to be buried with full military honors close to home and his family at the Port Hudson National Cemetery, just north of Baton Rouge. My dad was so proud to have been a dog-faced soldier with the 3rd Infantry Division. The Northern Front guys, as dad called them, had only one D-Day. The Southern guys had five D-Days. And dad's 3rd Battalion of the 30 Infantry Regiment had 70 days. The Northern guys, he would say, had 336 days in the war while the Southern guys had over 900 days in the war, of which the division was credited with 531 combat days, the most combat days of any unit in the European theater. The 3rd Infantry Division fought in places like Casablanca, Anzio, Rome, the Vosges Mountains, the Colmar Pocket, the Siegfried Line, Nuremberg, Munich, Biersgarden, and Salzburg. They battled over 3,200 miles through seven countries, and it was elements of the 3rd Infantry Division that captured Hitler's retreat, the Eagle's Nest, near Berchtesgaden. It was not the Band of Brothers. The 3rd Division was the only U.S. unit that served in all 10 campaigns of the European War and was among the first American combat units to engage in any offensive ground combat operations in World War II in French Morocco. The 3rd Division suffered the most casualties of any U.S. unit in the theater, suffering over, depending on who you read, between 25 and 30,000 casualties. And there are only about 12,000 in the entire unit. At times, the average life expectancy of a frontline junior officer like Dad was 21 days. 39 3rd Infantry Division soldiers were awarded the Medal of Honor one-fourth of all the medals of honor presented during the war. Further, 133 distinguished service crosses and over 2,000 silver stars were awarded, making the division the most honored in the Army in World War II. One of Dad's 3rd Infantry Commanders, General Lucien K. Truscott, who was one of the youngest division commanders in the U.S. Army in World War II, said it this way at sunset at the U.S. Cemetery at Anzio on the first Memorial Day after the war, as he reminded each of us, we cannot look back to them if we do not look forward to the future for which they fought and for which they died. The cost has been great, almost at times too great. He added this, it's now our task to build the future on, on the solid foundation laid by those who have left us forever, never forgetting those who march with us in memory. Barbara and I have just returned from some of the battlefields of the Colmar Pocket. Every tiny town we visited that had been liberated by the 3rd Infantry Division had memorials remembering and honoring these brave Americans. I can tell you that the French there have not forgotten the suffering and sacrifices the young American soldiers made to liberate them from the horrors of fascism and Nazi rule. They would tell each of you to remember and realize the value of freedom. My and Mike Yorkey's book was a labor of love based on 16 years of research. And it was helped, it was written to help all of us as Americans remember a forgotten hero, but his also his buddies who fought on the forgotten front of Europe. And I'm happy to say that it's received international and national awards. And I'm excited that the book is being featured at the Louisiana Book Festival this coming Saturday. And I'm delighted that the LSU Military Museum here at Memorial Tower is opening an exhibit honoring Dad this evening, unveiling a replica of his officer's uniform and an updated shadow box with his many Valor Awards. And I'm extremely pleased that the book led to Dad's induction into the 3rd Infantry Division's Marne Hall of Fame on August 1st, 2023, 
Dad was inducted along with President Dwight D. Eisenhower, as well as Generals Marshall and Ridgeway and O'Daniel and McCarr. Recently, Dad's been nominated by General David Petraeus for induction into the U.S. Army's Officer Candidate School Hall of Fame. But more important than any single soldier story is this uniquely American story of hundreds of thousands of young soldiers and their officers who were well-trained, superbly skilled, and most of all, resilient in facing and conquering fear, heartbreak, death, dread, chaos, stench, casualties, wounds, and almost unimaginable opposition every day. Too many times to count, they entered, the, they entered battles they feared would end in inevitable defeat or certain death. They deeply appreciated that many of their buddies in the battle had left their all on the altar of war. The soldiers who died in battle sacrificed their tomorrows for our todays. And I hope you'll read the book and learn more about them and the suffering and sacrifices they endured and the successes that they accomplished to preserve for each of us liberty and, for, and, and freedom. I remember visiting Dad's grave up at Port Hudson after finishing a draft of the book with tears of gratitude streaking down my cheeks. I whispered, Dad, I have always loved being your son. And now more than ever, I'm honored by it. And I'm more than thankful to be able to share his story with you today. I hope it's been a blessing for you.